any, anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? I'm the tallest in my family. <coughs> I come from a race of forest dwellers. You have to be short to get underneath the tree branches in the forest. <laughs> you have to be round to get through the winter. <laughs> when I was younger, high school band, we used to get our hair cut every Friday before a football game. And one day, I was sitting at, in the chair at the barber college, and this person standing behind me with clippers and shears says, you know, you're going to be bald before you're 30. I was thinking, I'm already losing I'm in high school in the 70s, and my hair, this would be too long for a high school band where I was. Okay. That's not fair. A few years later, I was in a fraternity, and one of my fraternity brothers, Dan Jasmer, he had beautiful hair. And I can say that as a guy. I mean, you, so you know how good looking this Dan was. He was a dishwasher with me at, at Denny's. Wore long sleeve satin shirts to wash dishes. He looked perfect. As good at the end of the shift as the beginning. He would spend 45 minutes every morning on his hair. You know, would, would try, you know, raw eggs and beer in his hair, or, you know, whatever people with hair do. <laughs> I, 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 just, I just made myself laugh. <laughs> I saw a picture about a year ago that they were getting ready for the uh, 50th anniversary of the first world title that the band won. I saw a picture of Dan. He still looks good. He's my age. And he looks like he just stepped off the pages of GQ. But, his wife said, he no longer spends 45 minutes on his hair. Dan is bald. <laughs> I mean, tell it's Zavala's bald. Really bald. I mention this because all the hours Dan spent all those years of hair products didn't last. Now, on the surface, middle-aged guy with not much hair left may not have a lot of room to say, don't worry about it. Have, have you ever done that, to, said to someone, just relax, don't worry about it, it'll be okay, just relax. Has telling someone to relax ever actually helped someone to relax? <laughs> this lesson, and the lessons from the prophet Joel, speak to us, as we people of faith, about one of the hardest things to do. Now, we're often told that forgiving is hard. And indeed, it probably is for many of us. But not worrying is just as hard. Maybe harder. You see, this lesson from Matthew, well, let's start off with Joel. <coughs> the prophet Joel 
showed people who were nobodies. Their country had been destroyed, their religion demolished, they were taken into exile, and the prophet said, relaying the words of God, don't worry about it. God will take care of you. It was nearly 2,500 years before Israel was a country again. That's a long time to wait for God's promises, isn't it? For 2,500 years, they read the prophet Joel, and they said, but the prophet said, don't worry about it. They heard those words in the concentration camps in Germany. They heard those words during their wars. They heard those war words during the Inquisition. And they kept hearing those words and said, God will provide. By the time of Jesus, <coughs> the recent boy on the block the Roman Empire had his boots sandal on the neck of the entire Mediterranean world. One day Jesus climbs up a hillside and Matthew records a series of his teachings. Some of them include the Beatitudes. Some of them are about divorce. Some of them are about murder. In the middle of all of that, Matthew records Jesus saying, relax. God is in control. Now, for his listeners gathered on that hillside, It made about as much sense as someone, as me standing up here this morning saying, relax. Last week I said, and where's Don? Is Don here? I heard that. He's in the kitchen. Oh, he's in the kitchen. Okay. <laughs> well, last week I said, we have enough money. Relax. We have all the money we need. We have all the people we need. We have everything necessary to worship God. Relax. Take a breath. Because God, the God we worship, doesn't need any of I once uh, got to preach in a, a little chapel in Cornwall in the village of St. Q. It's K-E-W. St. Q had a Methodist chapel. The cornerstone was laid by John Wesley himself. It was a historic building. It was really a big deal. But the building was an albatross. It had no heat, no air conditioning. It wasn't accessible. It looked good. The, the plaque on the front door that said this is a historic building was rusty. One day they said, I wonder, is this what John intended for us? So they up and sold the building to the golf course that had been built around it, took the money, gave it away, rented space in the village hall, <coughs> doubled the size of the congregation. 
congregation because they became known as the church that is present. Now, please don't mistake me. I am not suggesting that we knew that. <laughs> please don't go home tonight and start making phone calls that Pastor Charles said we should sell the building. No. First of all, there's no golf course. <laughs> Thank you. But I want us to remember why we have this building. Why we take these cards. Why we take an offering each Sunday. Why we exist at all as a community of faith. Is it to maintain a historic building or is it to worship the living God? If it is to worship the living God, then we have everything we need. For Matthew, writing in the, the shadow of the, the Jewish wars, when the armies under Vespasian, or the legions rather, destroyed the second temple, never to be rebuilt. Twice, people of Israel had believed that the dwelling place of God needed to be here, needed to look like this, needed us to do the heavy lifting. But Jesus, But Jesus had told his disciples, who had told others, who had told still more, that Jesus had sat on the hillside and said, relax. God will provide. You know, this past, uh, past Thursday, when the community gathered in this very room and said goodbye to Bill Schneider. He used to sit right back there. That evening, I'm sitting on the, the deck of the parsonage spending quality time with the, the neighborhood cat that adopted us, waiting for the appearance of the evening raccoon patrol. <laughs> and I got to wondering, who's next? Because you see, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. I mean, think about how serious that is. None of us. I could be gone by sundown. Could be one of you. In the time you have left on this planet, do you have what you need to live? <coughs> Can you draw breath? Have you eaten today? Do you have safety? Do you have the means to survive? If you do, and are not worried about any of those things, then guess what? You're wealthier than the majority of the world. We spend so much time worrying about what could go wrong all the things that could happen to us if we don't hold on to the last bit of control that little bit of extra just in case for a rainy day but jesus says to us consider the lilies of the field they don't oil, they don't spin, but even 
saw him in all of his glory wasn't arrayed like one of them. Do you know where Solomon is today? Anyone know where King Solomon is? He's dead. <laughs> he was wealthy. He was handsome. He was intelligent. He was anointed by the prophet to be king over Israel. And where did it get him? Buried. Bill Gates will die one day. And all of his billions will go to someone else. The homeless person sitting out in front of Walmart in Missoula will die one day. And what little that person has will go to someone else. You see, all of life, everything, is a gift from God. What's happening out in California right now is approaching a hundred dead, over a thousand missing, tens of thousands of structures destroyed. Do you think the people who lived in Paradise, California, do you think they didn't have dreams and hopes and treasures? All that's gone. Does that mean that God doesn't love them? Or God didn't care? I believe that God was in the midst of that firestorm. With the children of God taking their last breath in terror. The animals who perished along with their human companions, that God was with them too. That whether they celebrate the joys of life or weep, in death. God is there. See, when Jesus gathered his disciples and the crowd around him that day, he wasn't offering platitudes. He wasn't offering cliches. He was reminding them about the relationship they have with their creator. And that creator isn't going to give up on you just because, well, fill in the blank. Just because you're poor, just because you're rich, just because you're a woman, just because you're old, just because you're a child, just because you're dead. Nothing will take that away. Nothing comes between you and your Savior. Hold on to that. And whatever comes, whatever comes, remember. Thank that God.